topic by Dr. Miravalli is Mary and Divinization, Father Peter Damien Fellner on Mary and the Holy Spirit. And uh, Dr. Miravalli is Assistant Professor of Systematic Theology at Mount St. Mary's Seminary. Thank you. Um, so many of you know my father, yes. who is the Miravalli who usually comes and speaks on Mariology. So just, just a quick guide. Um, he's Mark, I'm John Mark. Uh, he knows a lot more about Mariology than I do, and I'm much better looking. So that will help you uh, tell us apart. Um, let me begin by reading the text, and then I may, to serve the interests of time, um, summarize uh, a little more quickly. Father Peter Damien Fellner sees the key locus for understanding the profound relationship between Our Lady and the Holy Spirit, not so much in the writings of salaried academicians, but in the meditations of the saints. Father Fellner's presentation of Franciscan Mariology and Pneumatology from Francis through Bonaventure and Scotus, finally climaxing in St. Maximilian Kolbe, powerfully illustrates the ineffable bond existing between the divine advocate and the woman advocate, the consoler and the co-redemptrix. It seems to me that perhaps the best way to unpack Father Fellner's insights on Mariology and Pneumatology is to begin rather sensationally by recalling St. Maximilian's provocative language concerning Mary and the Holy Spirit, and then discuss how Father Fellner employs all the resources of the Franciscan tradition to contextualize, clarify, and confirm the insights of St. Kolbe. So in other words, I'm going to take the famously strong language of St. Maximilian, go through um, six expressions that he uses, um, and then hopefully provide a very brief summary of the structure within which Father Fellner helps us to understand and acknowledge the genuine insights that the saint bequeathed to us. So, what are the six strong expressions that Saint Maximilian Kolbe uses? The first one actually is not that strong, shouldn't be that controversial, but for some reason it is. Uh, it's spouse of the spirit. This is the one, of course, that is famously used by Saint Francis. And for most common sense Catholics, this shouldn't seem to be a reason for any controversy, but um, a lot of the people who write Mariology aren't common sense Catholics, and so there is uh, continual debate. But we'll leave that for now. It doesn't seem too problematic. A little trickier is the expression um, denoting the Holy Spirit as the uncreated Immaculate Conception. This is hard for many of us to deal with. We've, we've just barely gotten over the surprise of Lourdes, and we still don't quite understand what it means to say she is the Immaculate Conception as opposed to she was immaculately Conceived. So what, what can Father Colby mean? What can St. Colby mean when he says not only that Mary is the created Immaculate Conception, but the Holy Spirit is the uncreated Immaculate Conception? But really, these aren't too difficult. We, with a little theological finesse, we can, generally, um, we can just generally present these expressions in a non-controversial way. Where things really become challenging in Mariological dialogue is with the following four when St. Kolbe says that Mary is the complement of the Holy Trinity, when St. Kolbe says that Mary is the quasi-incarnation of the Holy Spirit, when St. Kolbe says that Mary is a quasi-part of the Holy Trinity, and most famously, when St. Kolbe says that Mary, not most famously, I should say, maybe most, most challengingly, that Mary is transubstantiated into the Holy Spirit. That's the big one, right? That's where the Thomists and the Ecumenists, who are very rarely the same people, join together and, and, and bow their heads and, and wondering what can St. Colby mean? Well, since the martyr of charity didn't have the time to explain himself systematically, he had to attend to the more pressing business of greater the love than which no man has, uh, Father Fellner has dedicated himself over the decades to showing us the truth that is inherent in these, these, these profound and, and provocative expressions. But to get there, we first have to do some groundwork looking at the Catholic doctrine of divinization and at it, its expression in the Franciscan tradition and finally in the work of Father Fellner. So, if I could begin just reviewing some of the basic biblical and magisterial high points of the doctrine of divinization. The first comes from John 10. The Jews answered him, 
We are not stoning you for a good work, but for blasphemy. You, a man, are making yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, you are gods? If it calls them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be set aside, can you say that the one whom the Father has consecrated and sent into the world blasphemes because I said, I am the Son of God? In other words, what our Lord is pointing out is that the language of divinization, you are God, you are to become God, is present already in the Old Testament. But then, of course, it's most explicitly confirmed in the New Testament in the second letter of Peter, where it is declared that we will all, by destiny, if we are saved, become partakers of the divine nature. Now, surely, the language of St. Peter is not stronger than the language of St. Colby. Partaker of the divine nature? Take a couple samples from the um, theological tradition. St. Athanasius very famously says of our Lord that, quote, he was made man that we might be made God. St. Thomas Aquinas, also very famously standing for scholasticism, declares, quote, it was the will of God's only begotten Son that men should share in his divinity. He assumed our nature in order that by becoming man he might make men gods, end quote. We can't distinguish it away. The fact is it is a datum of revelation that we are called, mysteriously granted, but we are called to attain to some level of divine existence, to attain to some share in what is properly the life and love of the Godhead. How does this happen? Well, according to Father Fellner, this happens through what is called dynamic or exemplary or personal causality. This is a very interesting causality with which I wasn't familiar before I started researching Father, Del uh, Father Fellner's work. He distinguishes it sharply, first of all, from the four Aristotelian causes, and secondly, from the Thomistic distinction between moral and physical causality. Rather, this dynamic exemplarism, this personal causality, stems from the triune nature of God himself. Because God is threefold, three, tripersonal I should say, because God is tripersonal, he imprints something of his ordered nature, not just his singular nature, but his ordered nature to everything that he's made, whether it's the traces at the level of the material creation, whether it's the image at the level of the human person, or whether it's the much profounder likeness that belongs to the soul and grace. Father Fellner frequently recurs to Bonaventure's theme that because the Trinity is ordered Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all of creation is ordered or even hierarchized. Now, because Mary is at the supreme peak of creation, she reflects the Trinity in a way that is radically distinctive, that is unparalleled anywhere else in, in the universe of spirit or matter. Which is why Bonaventure frequently calls Mary, excuse me, Bonaventure calls Mary, and Father Fellner frequently cites Bonaventure here, says that Mary is a hierarchy unto herself. Mary reflects the Trinity in a way unlike any other creature. So, Who is the one who affects this supreme participation of Mary in the divine life, this supreme divinization, this supreme theosis, this supreme share in God's nature? Who is the one who brings this about? Well, the Holy Spirit. Through the Catholic tradition, it is consistently the Holy Spirit who is primarily cited as the one who raises us to the divine level. Uh, perhaps most notably by Leo XIII, uh, who, who confirms that it is to the Holy Spirit that we primarily attribute this great work. All right. Once we have all these pieces in place, the fact that we are all called to divinization, to deification, to theosis, to being made partakers of the divine nature, that the Holy Spirit does this and that he does it chiefly in the Mother of God, then we can go back to those six remarkable expressions of St. Colby and understand them in the proper Catholic light. So, we'll begin with what seems to me the most challenging uh, of all those expressions, the expression that Mary is transubstantiated into the Holy Spirit. 
let me quote here so I make sure I get it right. Mary is transubstantiated into the Holy Spirit in the sense that she is divinized, made the partaker of a new nature, brought into God's inner life. Here, according to Father Fellner, St. Colby is simply continuing the tradition from St. Bonaventure, who holds that, quote, sanctifying grace transforms the substance of the soul to the point of radically altering the mode or order of loving from that of a creature in view of the fulfillment to that of a divine person solely in view of the supreme good, end quote. Although this description of sanctifying grace differs from the Thomistic tradition, in which sanctifying grace involves an accidental, not substantial change, it can certainly be harmonized with the Catholic tradition as a whole. If we are all to partake of a new nature, the divine nature, if we are all to become gods or even become God, if we are all to make the transition from operating at the human level to living at the divine level, then we should not be surprised to find this described as a transition from one primary mode of being to another, from one nature to another, from one substance to another. Sanctifying grace is in itself the shift from natural to supernatural, without, of course, any obliteration of our human nature. And if this, quote, transubstantiation is undergone by each of the baptized and each of the glorified, then why not by our mother? Now, let me pull back and say I have had a lot of fascinating conversations over the last several months, both with Orthodox Christian friends and with Thomist friends. And one of the things I've concluded, although I'm very open to clarification from, from anyone here, especially Father Fellner, is that once we say that all changes either impact us at the level of accident or at the level of, sub, of substance, there's going to be different benefits from uh, that accrue from describing sanctifying grace either as belonging at the accidental level or at the substantial level. I was unaware that the Franciscan tradition talked about sanctifying grace as impacting the substance. But it makes sense. If you talk about sanctifying grace as a, an alteration on the accidental level, that's very important, and that allows the valid insight that our humanity endures glorification. We don't lose our humanity through grace. We don't lose our humanity by getting to heaven. But if you point out that this impacts us at the level of substance, that helps us remember that divinization means that we are allowed to do something that is more proportionate to God than to humanity, which was a, a, an insight I, I simply had never fully appreciated. Moving on to the second expression, we can approach Mary as quasi part of the Trinity in the same vein. It does not imply the transition from a Trinity to a quaternity. Notice the quasi at the beginning, which Father Fellner reminds us, indicates analogy, and therefore a similarity as well as a dissimilarity. Rather, this expression, quasi part of the Trinity, applied to Our Lady, refers to the participation in divine life through grace, enjoyed at the highest levels by the Blessed Virgin. To quote from Father Fellner, such a human person so united to the divine will is eo ipso a part or quasi part of the Blessed Trinity, with unique relations to each of the divine persons precisely because perfect personality entails a communion of love. In other words, Mary is a quasi part of the Trinity because she participates in Trinitarian life, as we are all called to do, although never to the full level that she achieves or that she is given. Because Mary achieves, excuse me, because Mary is gifted with this supreme participation in the divine life, and because she offers no resistance to the Holy Spirit, she is the perfect correspondence on the human level with the Holy Spirit on the divine level. Which is why it makes sense, and this was fascinating as well, it's why it makes sense to call the Holy Spirit the uncreated immaculate conception, simply to show that there is this radical correspondence. And it fa it's fascinating too, the way St. Colby links this to Our Lady's self-given title at Lourdes. She has to say, I am the Immaculate Conception, because that shows that she is always at every moment a perfect correspondence to the Holy Spirit, who is the eternal, now Immaculate Conception at the divine level. She can't say, I was Immaculately Conceived, because that would simply indicate that she, at one point, paralleled at the human level 
the Holy Spirit at the divine level. But because she uh, parallels him perpetually at every moment, she is the Immaculate Conception. Fascinating insight. Uh, St. Maximilian Kolbe also links Our Lady's self-given title at Lourdes with the title given by St. Francis to Our Lady, Spouse of the Holy Spirit, pointing out brilliantly that spouses have the same name. And so Our Lady and the Holy Spirit have the same name with, in a sense, a different first name. One, the eternal Immaculate Conception, the other, the human Immaculate Conception. Lovely imagery. The two final expressions dealing with Mary and the Holy Spirit are invaluable in illustrating how it is that the Holy Spirit is reflected through the Blessed Mother. Thus, Mary is the complement of the Holy Tr Trinity temporally because the Spirit is the complement of the Holy Trinity eternally. He is, in a sense, the fullness of the Holy Trinity. He is the last person who fulfills the eternal processional sequence. In fact, it is the Holy Spirit who is some way the eternal foundation for all final causality. For in him, the Trinitarian processions reach their conclusion, their final point of completion. So to call Mary, quote, the complement of the Trinity, this is from Father Fellner, is to assign her in the economy of salvation and so in economic theology, a central role which is also that of the Holy Spirit, end quote. What does that mean? It means that Mary reflects the Holy Spirit not only in her being, but also in her action, in her agency within the world. Finally, we come to the expression which has probably received the most ink since the death of St. Maximilian Kolbe. Mary has the quasi-incarnation of the Holy Spirit. Here again, there is no affirmation of anything like a hypostatic union. Rather, there is the affirmation of something like an incarnation of the Holy Spirit. The point is fairly transparent. Just as our Lord's humanity perfectly expresses the second person of the Trinity, so too does Our Lady's humanity perfectly express the third person of the Trinity. Right? So in both cases, it's fair to say that a divine person is perfectly expressed by a human nature. The glaring difference, of course, is that in the case of the human nature of our Lord, there is no human person. There is no second person. Whereas in the human nature of Our Lady, there is a second person. And this distinction is repeatedly clarified by Father Fellner, has the distinction between a proper possession and an appropriated possession. So a proper possession is where a person in the Holy Trinity exclusively is correlated with a human person. In other words, only our, uh, well, let me, let me read it, let me read it just to get it just precisely right. While a proper possession can involve only a single self, such that no one but Jesus can be the eternal word, an appropriated possession can involve many selves. Thus, the relationship between Mary and the Holy Spirit not only involves two persons, it further invites all persons to participate in it. It is precisely this which Colby has in mind when he says that we must all be, quote, transubstantiated into the Immaculate, as she has been transubstantiated into the Holy Spirit. All humanity is invited into the multi-personal exchange between God and creature, which Mary enjoys first and foremost with the Holy Spirit. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're doing beautifully. Uh, let me read the conclusion. It scarcely needs to be said that Father Fellner's work on the relationship between Mary and the Holy Spirit has vast implications. I would contend that among the most crucial implications is that his work provides yet another answer to the question, why do we need Mary? And look, this is the question that we're just going to have to face probably till Christ comes again. In a post-Reformation world, this is the question that we're going to get battered with again and again and again. Why? Well, I think because Martin Luther rigorously and disastrously misapplied the principle of parsimony, which is a great principle in math and logic, the principle of the fewer the better. He misapplied that to Christ's family. The law of parsimony so suited to matters of pure logic in a post-Reformation world is restlessly and repeatedly misapplied to the divine economy. The question is, why Mary? Or for that matter, why Mary or the saints or the church herself when we could have just Jesus? Why clutter up an elegant and immediate spirituality, the spirituality of solus Christus, with a complicated tangle of intermediates, represented first and foremost by the Mother of God? We have a lot of answers to that question already, of course. Because that's how God wants it, we could say. Because Scripture says so. 
because the church teaches that Mary is indispensable to the order of salvation. Or we could just say that without the mother of Christ, his family would be fatally incomplete. But with Father Fellner's exposition of the Franciscan tradition, we are given greater confidence in responding with a new answer. We need Mary because of her relationship to the Holy Spirit. This is a fascinating point. In the Trinity, in its unveiling of itself to the world, each person is revealed by another person. So the Father is revealed by the Son, right? No one knows the Father except through me. By the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And no one knows the Son except through the Spirit. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit. So, by whom is the Spirit known? Will the Spirit be the first of the divine persons to just reveal himself? Will he be the first one to break these divine decencies? Actually, the Catechism says no. The Catechism says that the Holy Spirit will not speak of himself. And it actually uses the most, I mean, this is a phrase to take to meditation for years. The Catechism says that the Holy Spirit displays, quote, divine self-effacement. So who will show the Holy Spirit? Well, quite simply, Mary will. Mary will reveal him. Mary will express him perfectly. The Spirit is made manifest through his effects on the human soul, and by implication, then, if there is one in whom he achieves his greatest effects, it is there that he most manifests himself, reveals himself, and makes himself known. The procession of economic unveiling is therefore clear. Who manifests the Father? The Son. Who manifests the Son? The Spirit. Who manifests the Spirit? Well, quite simply, Mary does. Everyone who responds to the Spirit's promptings shows the Spirit's personality and power. So we all have to show the Spirit in some way, but Mary does it better than anyone else. In fact, as we have seen from St. Father, from Colby through Father Fellner, Mary is, in a sense, human responsiveness to the Holy Spirit. Consequently, Mary, and to a lesser degree the saints in every soul in grace, is not a peripheral figure on the margins of salvation. And, and we're all guilty of this, not just Protestants, but Catholics. Protestants think of Mary as a side distraction, but Catholics often think of Mary as just a fringe benefit. But Mary is the key in the processional revelatory sequence that leads us straight back to the Spirit, to the Son, and finally to the origin of all things in time and in eternity. Mary isn't the substitute for the Holy Spirit, his congard needlessly alarmed. She is his human representative, his avatar, his created personal reflection. To quote from Father Fellner, quote, In venerating the Immaculate, we eo ipso venerate the Holy Spirit and enter into the dynamism of the order of grace, the sharing in the divine nature of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. End quote. It is she who has been divinized first and foremost, and looking to her reveals to us the Spirit's power and welcomes us into the divine life which he alone can bestow. Thank you very much. Father Peter? That was a very good presentation. Okay. Surprising how many of the things that appear to be only in Bonaventure and in Scotus reappear there. He also found similar things in St. Thomas. So it was a commonplace in the Middle Ages to speak of this and that saintly person as a part of the Trinity for the very reason that he speaks of it. I think that passage, he, at least in one place, it, it refers back to St. Saint, saint, saint Thomas. Um, and it is true, St. Thomas does also speak in that way, right? so there must be some legitimate, uh, legitimate use of this. Another interesting point, he brought up the question of the compliment is one of the titles titles of the uh, divine person of Holy Holy Spirit. That's very, very it's a patristic title, a comp a comp compliment, which uh, uh, long before Maximilian came, uh, came along, was also applied to a lady. There was a certain indication of a relationship uh, ship there as, as uh, the Holy Spirit is the complement of the Father and the, and the Son, the Son, so Our Lady, uh, Our Lady, as the spouse of the Holy, Holy Spirit in the economy of salvation, is the complement of the Father and, and the Son. So that, as there were, as many saints have pointed out, but not least Saint Maximilian, Maximilian, the, uh, the Holy Spirit, with the 
consent of Our Lady, the Lady to be the Mother, Mother of God, the Holy Spirit, does nothing without the instrumentality of Our Lady being involved. This he mentions in many cases. It's a commonplace among many of the, of the saints that Our Lady is the unique, uh, but not as one who is is uh, hypostatically united to it, but precisely as one, one who is the possession of the Holy Spirit and vice versa, the possession of our our, our Lady, Father Manteau Bonami, 40 some years ago, <coughs> explained that very nicely in the little booklets that uh, translation of his French French uh, French work on on Saint Maximilian and the uh, and the mission of the Ho Ho Holy Holy Spirit, our, our Lady is not. Uh, 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 the human nature of the Holy, Holy Spirit, but rather so close to united that she perfectly reflects the pers personal characteristics of the Holy, Holy, Holy Spirit. Not that she becomes as a person the Holy Spirit, it is precisely in becoming children of Mary that we also begin to reflect uh, the, the personal characteristics of, uh, of the Holy Spirit and thereby the, those of, of Christ being incorporated into him him, the Holy Spirit, is is necessary. That is clear in the teaching of our Lord. So, a good presentation. Those are some other points that can be further de further developed. The actual actual influence, particularly of the Oriental Fathers on Saint Saint, Ma Saint, Saint Maximilian, and that includes not simply the old. Well, he had the whole all of them translated into Polish that he that he, that he used, but also. Uh, contemporary Byzantine the theologian uh, theolo Bogalkov and others. I, I think there were others as well involved. Because much that he says about the Holy Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit as the uh, 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 as the complement of the of the, of the Trinity, Trinity appear in the um, uh, the wisdom. Wisdom theology, Bogolkov and all others, but not uh, not with the things that those words that we we, we mm -hmm. wouldn't accept, such as uh, original sin in our, our Our Lady. I thought it was an excellent presentation. Um, I just wanted to know about the uh, divinization as participation. Because Second Peter one four, I think the, the Greek word is the derivative of koinonia, mm -hmm. which is a fellowship or sharing. And I think of Saint uh, John of the Cross in the ascent to Mount Carmel. He says, when we, if a, when we unite our wills to God's will, or anyone does, the, the person becomes God by participation. Right. And so this isn't such a. It, it's deep in the tradition. But it's, it, it, is that another way of saying God by participation, sharing the divine nature of being, a, you know, undergoing some kind of change of, of, of being or uh, yeah. the nature? I know, I know no. that substance and accident doesn't, is not so felicitous when it comes to discussing the mystery of grace. It's tricky. When, when, when those are the only changes that are kind of allowed by a system, yeah. then, then there's a strain there, I think. Um, and I would say another, another to me, another, another thought-provoking area is simply, as was mentioned by, uh, by Dr. Hart, that the natural-supernatural distinction is similar because when you say supernatural, you're talking, nature is substance, at least in the Thomistic system, and I think largely in, in scholasticism as a whole, nature is substance with, re res with respect to its activities. Right, to its to its power stru uh, structure. Um, so if you're saying it's supernatural, then what you're saying is that there's something going beyond nature, and not just the way the accidents go beyond nature, right? I, I could grow my hair back, and that would be an accidental change, but it wouldn't be supernatural. It wouldn't go beyond nature. Um, it's not likely either. I mean, it might be supernatural at this point, <laughs> uh, right? but, um, but I, could, I could put on some weight, and that would be an accidental change. We wouldn't say it's supernatural because it goes because it doesn't directly affect the nature, right? We would say it's, it's in a sense, less than natural. So I, I think the two dangers are very obvious. The one danger is to make the change such that human nature is, is deleted. But the other is to make the change, and I think this is what maybe St. Colby was impatient with, this idea of making grace sort of a minor modification, um, which it's not. It's, it's, it's unfathomably mysterious, and that's why he wanted to go for the much stronger language that 
that the tradition of divinization has already given us. I think, yeah, qualitas, that was the word used by the Roman Catechism, the divine quality, qualitas. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, I'm sorry. Father James? Mm -hmm. Who had their hand up, Father James or Father Wayne? Uh, both. James. Well, I'll <coughs> honor both of you. I just wanted to, uh, to ask you a question. Uh, we know that Maximilian Kolb, and maybe Father Peter could reflect with you on this, we know that his reflection on the Holy Spirit, that those particular thoughts on the uncreated, immaculate conception, quasi-incarnation, we know that those were dictated by him to his secretary on the morning of his arrest. So these were his last articulated thoughts, whereas his writings on the relationship of Mary to the Trinity began uh, perhaps even 10 years before that, uh, and by the mid-1930s. So I'm just curious to see whether his refinement of theological reflection on Mary and the Holy Spirit actually grew out of his theological reflection on Mary and the Trinity. Yes, I'll, I'll gladly defer to the expert in the room. Well, there's a great deal of, great deal of truth there. The Franciscan school, has always been closer to the teaching of the Oriental Fathers concerning the nature of, of Greece. And that appears in the Latin scholastics of the, uh, of the uh, 13th, 14th century, centuries. It's a distinction between created and uncreated grace. For the Franciscans, uh, Franciscans while they didn't agree entirely with uh, uh, Lombard uh, insisting only on the uncreated grace. They recognized that was the more important. Without the uncreated grace, what was called the, uh, the, uh, the created grace is really not supernatural. There is nothing there. It's just a more perfect disposition to being supernatural. But when you are supernaturalized, what does that involve? That requires uh, requires a re relation. It's the very presence uh, pre presence of God, and it cannot be, as it were, by way of quasi formal uh, formal ca uh, caus causation. That is as pantheistic as simply saying God is the God is the uh, form. This is one of the great arguments that's going on in hundred hundred years uh, 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 years ago. And uh, that, of course, brings us in line with the, with the teaching of some of the mystical the theologians of the, of the Oriental world, Palomas and, uh, and all this. How much were they influenced by St. Bonaventure? How much was St. Bonaventure influenced by some of the earlier fathers of the, of the East? And it reappears, and this is the element of the o Oriental theology that reappears in Maximilian Kolbe, a stress on the uncreated grace Grace, and specifically be appropriated to the Holy, 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 Holy Spirit. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Uh, Thank you. Do we have one time for I don't know. One more. The, uh, the I just want to come and spells the Holy Spirit you referred to, Francis. I believe that's seen you know, on his salutation to the Virgin. Mm -hmm. But that's also in the context of daughter of the Father and right. mother of the Word. Mm -hmm. And that is also then he applies that same language, that same language to the faithful Christian soul. Yeah, to the, the church. The, the letter, one of his letters there. And so this, that connection there of spouse, where it's used in Francis, is that connection then also maintained in, in uh, Maximilian at all? You know, when he talks about that spouse and the spirit? In terms, it is in terms of the, it's, it's the fruit in terms in a certain sense. You know, the spirit, the fruit of the incarnation, Mary's you know, the fruit and the spirit right. and the spousal, it makes some sense there. I was just wondering if that is at all maintained in that other aspect of the Trinitarian relationships. Yeah, and there's, and Father, you'll have to help me remember, what is the line from St. Francis that the church has to become? Virgin-made virgin. church? Virgin-made virgin church, right, church. exactly, the virgin-made church, which would seem to sort of uh, continue that theme, that, that yeah. everything in Mary is mm. meant to be... Church. In an, in, yeah, in an, in, an, in an imperfect way, the order reflected in us. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, yeah. Just a quick point on that, since Father is, and I have been dialoguing a lot about the Oriental tradition. If you take a look at Origen, uh, who was a great influence on people like Maximus, which I won't go into, but if you look at Luke 135, his exposition, and on Canticle of Canticles, you'll find that he notices that the Epischiazo in 135, which is the overshadowing of the Spirit, he recognizes that this is the Old Testament cloud 
that is over the meeting tent. He oh. correctly gets the context of <coughs> Exodus 24 and various, you know, temple worship. But then Mary has the first overshadowing, which is the most intense, uh, which is uh, the presence of the Word who sends out from himself into her the Spirit at that moment. And then he notices the next time that Epischiazo is mentioned is on Mount Tabor with the Apostles. And that is because he says that Mary is the prototype for our own participation in an overshadowing and a transformation in the Spirit. And so all people can be imitators of Mary by climbing Mount Tabor, basically, which is the life of penance, you know, which Mary doesn't have. This is the later interpretation mm -hmm. of the Fathers. So this whole epischiazo, this Marian theme, is central to origin, and then it's developed into Eucharistic theology in the East, which we did talk about, mm -hmm. which is essentially that the epiclesis at the Divine Liturgy is a calling down of the Holy Spirit on us to be transformed into Mary, as well as upon the gifts to imitate the incarnational change, which John Damascene explicitly says, as the Virgin uh, into Christ, so bread and wine into uh, Christ, so us. So there you have it. We thereby become spouses. Yes, we, we become mini Marys. Yeah. <laughs> um, is there another? We're running pretty close to the end, but would you, Trent, would you uh, want to comment? Yeah, ju just just a, a quick note, John Mark. Thank you, thank you very much. I thought it was a, a wonderful clarification. I just thank you. Uh, at, at a very quick note, just to I think you can deepen your your own argument, um, because um, Scotus and and the, the Scotus tradition broadly kind of developing a, a thought from Henry of Ghent. Of course, we'll, we'll not only see um, sanctification as, a, as substantial rather than accidental, but they'll see creation itself as such. You know, Thomas thinks that creation must, uh, the creation is accidental to us because quite naturally mm. it, it falls under the genus of relation, which of course is, is an accident. But um, Ghent first, but then Scotus will develop it, will say, well, no, that's, that's of course not, not true. It's the relation of creation is transcendental. It concerns a substance as such. Uh, so once you have the development of the Scotus tradition of absolute primacy of Christ and Mary, they do not hesitate, of course, to add the angels and everyone, even at the order of creation. Not just the order of grace, but at the order of creation. With the exact same argument mm. that, that yes, you, right. you allude to, for the very simple reason that we are created for divinization. For glorifying God. All right, I'm going to bring this to you a conclusion, so we you. have a five minute break before Gloria Dodd, but I'd also, I'd like us to just hear one word from the provincial of Our Lady of Ain, uh, Angel's Province, Father James McCurry, who might bring us up to date with the latest translation that's coming from the from the original Polish of uh, St. Maximilian Kolbe's. Yeah, uh, we've been working out of our international MI center in Rome for a critical edition in English mm. of the writings of Maximilian. Uh, it's uh, to be published. It's all done. And uh, the final copy editing on it is in the works, and we're expecting it to be published by September. Uh, so would this be like the equivalent of the Italian? Exactly. It now, and the, actually, it would be more the equivalent of the Polish. Okay. So it's uh, all based on the um, original Does that sources. cover all of those things that were in all of those Polish newspapers that he put out? Yes. So there's there Any, would be uh, nothing that... Uh, any Nothing art, left. Right. Any articles mm -hmm. that he himself composed mm -hmm. for the newspapers, not the newspapers themselves or the magazines that he mm -hmm. edited, but any articles that he wrote even for the um, Japanese publication, and he wrote them in Latin. This is all part of the official critical edition in English. So when might we expect it? September. Oh, wow. Right. Father James, thanks. Five-minute break, and uh, Gloria Dodd. Thank you.